you just start us off by telling us what is a step pool system? Yeah. So step pools occur based, usually in steeper streams, and it's made out of the largest grains in a lot rather coarse grain size distribution. And it'll, if you put it in profile, it would look like a ladder, kind of mm-hmm. a series of steps and pools going down. And you'll see them, you'll start to see them all over the place. People were also using them in restoration to try to bridge a discontinuity in the vertical profile. I just got interested in them. Yeah. Um, it's really funny though, they're right up next to cascades. So if you see a cascade system and one of the fun part is, is you can stand at a system because they're usually kind of mixed together in reality. You can see steps or you can see a cascade, depending on which one you're studying that okay. day. And what, could, can you make the distinction between step yeah. pool and cascade? Cascades are more random. Okay. I mean, it's just more, it's not that they're randomly spaced, it's just more random boulders all over the place. Oh, right, right. The steps, I mean, you really can tell a step differently. It's yeah. just that sometimes you get some random boulders in with it because you will have this sort of defined um, overflow into a pool that's been scoured just below the step form. And there's usually a hydraulic jump coming out of that and then it goes for a little while and then there's another one. Okay, so, and it creates so, a really nice sequence. So a step pool sequence has does definitely has a pattern, um, but whereas cascades, there's just kind of boulders here and there yeah. and the water's moving around it. Okay, but that issue of, the issue of pattern mm-hmm. seems to be at the heart of the work you were doing. Which, it sort of, I never really thought about it that way, I thought, when I was a grad student, I thought I was going to find the parameter that causes step pools to form and sets their spacing, and I was going to solve the whole problem. <laughs> Which is yeah. always the way uh, yeah. dissertations start. And then out. probably also world peace. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Right. <laughs> so let me let me frame this a little bit. Um, so the it, like for years, one of the yeah. cool things in our field is that there is a pretty regular. Um, meander spacing for meander rivers that essentially the the wavelength of meanders is like five to seven channel width so the meanders are pretty regular and it seems like in the literature there was a little bit of a debate about are are the spacings of steps regular or are they maybe more random and stochastic right and i think what happens we wanted to find you want to find a pattern we love to find patterns I was so sad that it turned out to not have a pattern, um, that it turned out to be more stochastic. And I think nowadays people are more okay with stochasticity, yeah. but definitely back when, so when the literature I was working on was from mostly 80s or before, because there really wasn't much on step pools. Yeah. And people were just sort of making hypotheses. They had very few data sets and they were saying, well, it seems to kind of fit a spacing that's like what we see in other places. And if you want it to fit that, you can give it enough of an error bar that within, you know, plus or minus, if you say it's four plus or minus one, you've got such a giant error bar, it's going right. to be it's 50%. Fit in there somewhere. Right, right. Yeah. Right. And some people thought they formed out of anti-dunes. They never actually saw it. They just mm-hmm. assumed it because they're like, well, they seem to be of a higher flow. And if we keep going up in flow rates, it should come after anti-dunes. Like we, they were again, analogizing to sand. Yeah. And I was really go- setting out to look at that anti-dune thing. So we had, you know, two different grain size distributions and we were going to test you know, basic deterministic testing in the flume. How does this all form? And so you were you, you weren't necessarily looking at like a statistical process. You were no. taking a existing hypothesis mm-hmm. about how these things formed and trying to reproduce it. Yeah, I definitely prefer things to be mechanistic. <laughs> yes, I do. It has taken me a long time to get used to stochastic. I yeah. really prefer to find answers and have mechanisms, but it just doesn't work that way in yeah. nature. All the, well, it doesn't work in our understanding of nature. Yeah. Yeah, so it came out to be most predominantly random. Mm. Is Poisson distribution. So after a short period, so there's always a distance right downstream of a step that another step won't form. And it's not all that long, but it's probably tied to turbulence. All right. So there's, you, I think you call it an exclusion zone. Yeah, it's I like, think it's exclusion It's zone. like three to six times the yeah. largest particle or something like that. Right, we tied everything to the largest particle. Okay. Like you don't get a step unless your largest particle is within like two, two to three, two, or maybe two and a half to three and a half. Um, takes that many of them to bridge the, the width of the channel. Okay, so, uh, which is, this is mind boggling, but if you go out and look at these systems, like you're, the largest particle has to be like a third of the channel width yeah. to form one of these. And they're monsters. We yeah. didn't really call them, I didn't even call them the D-max or the D-100, I called them the step forming grain size. Because even if you're at that D-90, you're still within a range. And that might be it, but you really, it's the biggest ones in that D90. So they're the step forming ones. And it's all about the channel width to grain size ratio at that point. And it was really well shown in my flume because the flume had smooth sidewalls. And we were really worried when we started out that it was never gonna form a step with smooth sidewalls, but that was gonna be part of the test. 
And that is when we formed steps. When we used the grain size distribution that did not include that largest size, no steps. Very nice gravel dunes. A few things you might call steps, but they were really more gravel dunes. And they weren't anti-dunes either. Mm. <laughs> but they, while well, they were in phase dunes, they didn't move. I like to see anti-dunes move. So you, you alluded to this, but I did think reading the paper, like scientists like to find order. We like to we like to find we like mm-hmm. to find equations or like and th- it is it is interesting that yeah. like the the outcome of your work is that this is a disordered process. Right. Um, what else is going on that I miss? You know, is there something there? But I don't know what it would be. And yeah. so, what are the what are the necessary components of forming a step? It's really just that ratio of width to step forming grain size. I mean, you're going to need to have a graded sediment because you have all the other sizes. And so this gets into like how you could then use them, which I've gotten to thinking about more over time that you can then adjust the width. So let's say you have a river, you want to form steps. Mm -hmm. You know, you could do the old school method, rip it all up, put in concrete, rebar down to wherever, make sure nothing ever moves. Or you can kind of leave the river alone but add some giant you know take that largest size that's in it assuming this is a river that would form steps let's hope so otherwise i'm not really sure why you're trying to form steps in it right which Um, this is also this is a classic restoration problem but let's just assume let's assume it's let's assume that this is supposed to be a step pool yeah (laughs) you're right half the time they're not right (laughs) and they put them in then all you would need to do is narrow the width in certain locations and you can do it wherever you want it's not, it doesn't have to form a spacing. It can be where it's most advantageous to have a narrow width, whether it's with you know a big rock on the side, root wads to add some habitat, something like that. But that's then you're going to force a location where you're most like 90% likelihood you're going to get a step there. You might get a few in between, but if you definitely want them there. And what's interesting is um, Chartrand recently wrote a paper well, a few years ago that showed you can do the same thing with riffle pull systems that that's all also controlled by channel width. So instead of just ripping up whole beds of rivers, just work on the banks and nudge the river towards the physical processes that set up the the bed form system you want. This is an excerpt from a podcast I did with Dr. Joanna Curran. For more of that conversation, check out the link to the RSM River Mechanics podcast down in the description.